welcome to What Would Larry Do? I am Dr. Ann, and I am here this morning with Larry Helwig. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, today's a special day. It is. What day is it? It's my anniversary. Oh, happy anniversary. Uh, thank you. How long have you guys been married for? 38 big ones. <laughs> well, congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah, we've been together 40 years. I don't know how she did it. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I don't either, but I will give her credit. Jen is truly probably one of the nicest people I've ever met in my entire life. And that's probably how she's lasted so that, long. That's why it works. <laughs> well, we will have to tell her happy anniversary yes. today. Yes, yes. Well, today's October 1st. As we're recording, obviously, this is going to come out on a different day. But as we're coming into the holiday season, everybody begins eating more, gaining weight, doing all kinds of things. So today we are going to be talking about the side effects of rapid weight loss when you are older, especially. Right, Larry? I think that people don't always um, take into account what age does. And, and so you have so many factors affecting you. And so when you take and lose weight, of course, you're going to have more laxity. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have that as a ongoing process with aging. And so you kind of get a double whammy. Yeah. So I was actually inspired to do this podcast based on a patient that we had come in. So we have a longtime patient slash friend of ours who showed up, I don't know what, two, three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, she recently was sober over the last year. So she just hit her one year mark of um, sobriety. And during that time, because of changing her lifestyle, she lost 60 pounds, but she's in her early 60s. So the side effect of this 60 pound weight loss over the last year was severe laxity. So she was able to get the tummy tuck surgery. She did a breast lift surgery, but she was in our clinic wanting to deal with her thighs. She did not want to do the thigh lift surgery. And we're going to talk about what all these are in just a moment. And so here, Larry and I are having to do an analysis on her, on her inner thighs, the front of her thighs, the back of her thighs, her butt. She works out all the time, and now she's having to figure out what to do with all this extra skin. So it really inspired me that we should talk about this with people because I don't think that people realize that when you're older, if you're going to do rapid weight loss, you are going to have some side effects with it. It's almost um, having a plan in advance of weight loss mm -hmm. um, because it affects you so much. And people don't pay enough attention to that, and they don't really think about it. They just, okay, I'm in a program now. I want to lose weight. I want to get this weight off. And they get very, very motivated and excited as they're losing more and more weight. Yes. And um, so, you know, we have devices that help with all that but mm -hmm. again doing everything in the proper uh, routine with a proper protocol really makes sense and many times like in her case you know she was so successful in losing all this weight and um, changing her lifestyle and everything but the consequences were adding up because of all the weight loss and the aging process. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> so that's so. why I wanted to bring up a couple different topics. Number one, and we're going to put up our photo of severe skin laxity, is side effects of extreme weight loss. So even when you're not older, if you are morbidly obese or, we, you know, when we see those biggest loser shows and there is rapid weight loss in a short period of time, especially if you've been morbidly obese for a certain amount of time, you get the side effects like this photo here where you have extreme weight loss everywhere. Stomach, thighs, butt, breasts, all of that stuff. Um, and then, of course, besides the body, if you are older and you are doing rapid weight loss, I want to show the photo of lipoatrophy of the face as well, where that photo will depict and how besides body, like we were showing on that initial photo, that the face suffers when you are doing rapid weight loss when you are older. Well, all the time, <clears throat> your face is aging all the time. And, you know, we've talked in other previous programs how your peak is really age 15. By age 30, it's um, sort of over. You, <laughs> you, you're no longer producing the fibroblasts that produce the collagen and the elastin, everything starts to slow down dramatically. 
And given enough time, you really start to see what's happening. And so we have patients come in at age 37, 39, 40, 41, and they're saying, okay, something is really changing. My, uh, I, you know, and, and it's not just the face, it's the neck. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, pretty much everywhere. And so we've, we've been for a long time saying that if you are around 40, you probably have laxity mm -hmm. somewhere you know, maybe even multiple places, but at least somewhere because, again, think back, your peep was age 15. Yeah. Well, and then that's the collagen loss. But, of course, <clears throat> in the face, you lose fat, you lose bone, you lose muscle. And typically all over the body, you also lose muscle and bone. And so people don't attribute some of those things to laxity, which is why in some of our non-invasive technology that we're going to talk about, we are also going to talk about how to address this. The other area that people don't realize that creates a lot of laxity is yo-yo dieting, where if they're going up and down and up and down, and that means in big amounts. You know, if you have your normal 5 or 10 pounds that you're within, it's no big deal, but it's more if you're gaining 50 and then losing 30 and then gaining another 25 and then losing another 35. That can attribute to skin laxity issues that you're going to be dealing with when you're older, just like in the cases of pregnancy. So people really need to think about that when they're like, oh, it's the holiday season. I'm going to, it used to be pack on five to 10 pounds. Definitely in the last year, I've seen people more packing on 20, 25, 30 pounds over the holidays and then plan to lose it once January comes around. But if they're not considering the issue of laxity that they're going to be dealing with when they're older, I hope they're listening to this and thinking about that now. I've heard different uh, numbers for COVID, you know, during this break, you know, some are saying, you know, the average weight gain was mm -hmm. 20 pounds. Some, some I've heard as high as 25 to 28 pounds, uh, but whatever, you know, that, that's something that all of a sudden we have this weight we didn't have before. Now, what are we going to do? Yeah. And, um, how's your weight loss going? Yeah. So <laughs> I, uh, I may have gained a few. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm working on it uh, quarter pound by quarter pound. Oh, okay. It's like a quarter pounder. Yeah, like you're eating the quarter pound burgers as part of your weight loss? Yeah, we, I'm trying to <laughs> shove them away. <laughs> yeah. All right, Larry, and you wanted to talk about one more issue with the whole weight loss and things like that going on. It's kind of a different avenue. Well, when you're, when you're having weight loss and... Uh, which avenue did you want me to go down? You There's so many. Cryolipolysis. Ah. <laughs> well, you wanted me many... to let you throw it in there, so here's your opportunity. All right. Uh, so we're very familiar. I think everyone is very familiar with cool sculpting, mm -hmm. and what's you know that that is a method for killing fat. There, so there's multiple ways out there: radio frequency and a lot of different things, cool sculpting over the years. You've seen all the ads on television and what have you. Um, you. You know, if it's something you're considering, you may want to Google um, class action lawsuit, you know, cool sculpting. So there have been issues that have happened, and we know some of those people that it happened to. And without going into great detail, you're actually... Um, gaining fat. So mm -hmm. it kills fat, but then you gain fat. And uh, it usually requires a liposuction or some kind of surgery to eliminate it. And um, so it's been going on for a long time. And so I just would say to everyone, uh, be careful, you know, think about what te technology and uh, uh, procedures you're having done, uh, both surgical and non-surgical. Um, do your homework and uh, be careful because uh, yeah, I think it's happened far more than we have, we have thought about. Well, and especially that case, tying it in with the <clears throat> fact that if you are 50 plus and you choose to do this and you end up with rapidly increasing fat cells that then you have to turn around and have liposuction to get rid of, what's one of the things that anybody has to do post liposuction? wear a garment for four to six weeks to prevent laxity because liposuction is a little rough on the skin. So therefore, you have to have this garment to hold everything in place to hope the skin bounces back. If you're 50, 55, 60, 65, and all of a sudden now you have to have massive liposuction on your stomach, 
you are going to need some skin tightening intervention. So that's where it kind of tied into this, that people have to think about that as, you know, if I'm choosing to do this and it becomes a side effect, I really need to think about what's going to happen to my skin. And, and the more you look at your body and the changes in your body, just pay attention. You know, what do I want to have? What do I need to have? What can I do on my own? And when I go to an office, find out everything about the technology and what they're doing and how they're going about it. Uh, do some research on your own yeah. uh, and check it out for sure. So um, I, I think nowadays you have a lot of good options, but just remember when volume is, is reduced, laxity, you know, remains. Yes. And um, we had, I had a patient <clears throat> years ago, and she had gained a tremendous amount of weight when she was young. And uh, so she ended up having surgery for pretty much her entire body. And so they, 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 they cut the tissue, they pull it tight, mm -hmm. cut off the extra tissue, suture it back. Yep. And they did that, and she said that within a year to a year and a half, she had to have it again. Because, you know, perhaps it was because of at a young age she stretched so much, mm -hmm. um, she had to have it again. And, and really, again, you're mm -hmm. taking tissue at this point that's older tissue and you're just making it tight tissue, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to stay that way. So do be aware of all of that. Um, we ended up doing a lot of procedures that are more the skin tightening type procedures to try to help her with that. So. Be careful. Yeah. Well, now that we know that, you know, mm. rapid weight loss when you're older, um, extreme weight loss from being morbidly obese and yo-yo dieting and things like that can actually lead to the side effect of skin laxity, skin laxity in the body, skin laxity in the face. Um, that's the number one complaint I get with even people who are maybe 40s and 50s who I've lost my 20 pounds now, but all of a sudden my face looks older. So we're going to start to talk about what can we do to address this problem and maybe how to prevent it. The first area I want to jump into is like Larry was just talking about with this patient though is bariatric surgery. That if we have morbidly obese patients that lose a lot of weight or sometimes extremely rapid, here's some of our photos. These are before and afters of tummy tuck, thigh lift, breast augmentation, all is one. And I mean, it can be amazing when patients have gone from being, you know, three, 400 pounds down into less than 200 pounds they're gonna have a lot of excess skin that they need cut off here. And so this can be a game changer for them because at this point with this amount of laxity going on here, the patients are never gonna be able to come into the non-invasive world and fix this stomach, fix these thighs without a surgical intervention. Um, but as you can see, you know, there are scars and that's what we're going to kind of talk about with these two, that even though it's an amazing transformation, this surgeon did an amazing job with both of these patients for tummy tuck and thigh lift. Larry and I are going to go into not only the recovery of this, we'll start with tummy tucks because that's a good place to start. So let's talk about what a tummy tuck entails. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's involved, and there are different types of tummy tucks, but normally what they're doing is they are... Uh, horizontal uh, incision going across the abdomen, lower abdomen. And what they want to do is undermine that tissue, take anything out that's in there that's excess fat uh, or volume, and pull the tissue tight and suture it up. And so, you know, you'll hear from patients who have had this that, you know, for some it wasn't that big a deal. For others it was like uh, eight months to 12 month recovery. Yes. So I think that's the thing is you really have to have a, a conversation with your uh, surgeon mm -hmm. about it and what is the real timeline for getting back in the ball game? Be yeah. Because you know, anytime you pull anything, of course you want it tight, you're paying to have it tight. Yes. Right? Yes. And the tighter you make that, what <laughs> happens? I mean, you know, you're, you're almost bent over oh, when yeah. you want to stand up straight. It's because it's pulled tight and it's going yes. to take time for all that yeah. to relax. Especially in that first two to six weeks, I've heard that from multiple patients who've had it, that they thought they were never going to stand up straight again. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I told them, look, you want it tight. Cause I agree with you. If the surgeons don't pull it that tight in a year, you're going to have laxity again. And you're going to be like, you didn't do a good job. So 
it does have to happen. Also, you're going to have that hip to hip scar. It's not a C-section incision scar. That's a tiny one across the center of the stomach. It wraps around hip to hip. That is why I wanted to show a couple of those photos though, because in extreme cases, those patients don't care about a hip to hip scar. They had so much extra skin and so much volume that still needed to be taken out that they were never going to look normal even in clothing again. And so they're willing to do the trade off of the downtime, the six weeks of downtime, the pain, you know, residual for a few months, the hiding the scar because the transformation of their body was so amazing. And I see a lot of tummy tucks that are very successful that can be a huge difference for women, for women post babies, for women in bariatric surgery. The one I feel like is a little bit harder to get right is the thigh lift. So let's, let's jump in and talk a little bit about the thigh lift because both those photos that you saw included a thigh lift. So now the scarring of the thigh lift is 360 all the way around so that you did see that on one of those photos where you could see that scar going all the way up around her hips. But it's also pretty much from the inner knee all the way up to the inner thigh into the groin area is another scar. So if you want to talk a little bit with your patient experience about how they had to pull her both up and in, correct? Correct. So that's a, that's a pretty big process. And um, they, they do have a difficult time with it. Um, you have a lot more scarring that's going on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, initially, nobody thinks about the scar. You know, yeah. you're thinking about, okay, I just need this tight, whether it's an abdomen or a thigh or anything. I just want it looking tight. I want it looking good. And that's what they're after. That's what they're trying to achieve. And uh, that happens for them. So then they're excited about it. Uh, but it is involved. Again, you know, uh, it, it's a lot of area to treat. Mm -hmm. And I think as you expand areas, you expand risk. You know, yeah. how is this going to come out? Because if you th think about a thigh, you know, up at the hip, you are, it is so entirely different than down by the knee. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, think about the, the uh, width and, and the diameter and what, what are you dealing with and how are you going to make that all come together beautifully and have it looking good at the end of the day. So I think it is a big deal, but again, for patients, if they can get it tight, that's number one. Then they're very happy. The idea of the scar doesn't bother them until they've gotten farther down the road. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, whatever's left behind is always what bothers you. Yeah. I mean, you can treat a face that's got six different issues. There's a texture, there's a pigment, there's fine lines, there's uh, wrinkles, there's laxity, there's whatever. Mm -hmm. And you could treat five of the six beautifully. Well, the sixth one is now what they're staring at. Mm -hmm. You know, so <laughs> it's like, well, you know, look at this. You know, I still got this, you know. And it's, it's like even though all the other five, and that's... That's why when you're dealing with any of these things, what are you going to be able to do? What can you accomplish for the patient? How can you help them the most? Mm -hmm. and, and being very truthful about can I make a difference? Now, for us, we treat scars all the time. Yes. And I think most of the time, scars can come out beautiful. You yep. know, you, you can do a real nice job cleaning them up and making people look really good. But I do think, you know, it, it is a step-by-step -step process. You don't, you're not thinking about the scar initially. You're thinking about that after everything else is good. Yeah. And speaking of that, for scars is um, brachioplasty or the surgery Ooh. on the arm is a big one. Yeah. This is the one that I see patients like to avoid most commonly because especially being here in Arizona, you're going to have a, you know, a um, three-quarter sleeve scar basically from your elbow up to your armpit on the arm. I mean, if you have, again, extreme laxity and you don't care if there's a scar and you just want to look good in clothing, that's fine. I find this is the most common surgery that patients want to avoid based on the scar being hard to hide, especially with us being in Arizona where, you know, it's tank top season year round. Most of our patients want to look better in a sleeveless dress. They don't want to have to hide the scar that's there. And so we'll talk about the different non-surgical options where tummy tucks I see happening more often, the brachioplasty I see patients shying away from. It's difficult. We've had patients that come in and they wish they hadn't done the procedure because they hate the scar so much. Yeah. You know, and some, some scars are a little uh, smoother. They're wider, you know. Um, others are really 
bound together tight. They're elevated, they're hypertrophic. Yes. And it's like um, quite a process to really take that down, smooth that out, and make it look like it's all blended in. And uh, so it's a, it, that's a challenge. And if there are other options for that area, I think people should at least look at every option there is. Absolutely. And of course, I'm not really going to get into this one, but obviously facelifts and neck lifts would be a part of the rapid weight, la- uh, treating the laxity post rapid weight loss. Um, but those surgeries, I feel like have really been perfected where you can hide the scars well, you can make your patients come out looking very natural. But as you've noticed, most um, plastic surgeons have had to add in things like fat transfer or other long lasting fillers or sculpture that we're going to talk about because it's not just pulling the skin tight. It's also the lipoatrophy. So when you go to see your surgeon for a facelift or a neck lift, he is going to talk about both of these options. So now that we've kind of talked about the surgical options, I do want to dive into our non-surgical options. And we're going to start with, you know, first non-surgical skin tightening and, and talk about, you know, who is a candidate for this? when they've got the laxity? Um, I, when, when I'm looking at tissue and doing an assessment, uh, what is the age of the patient? How does the skin respond? Like if you try to do a snap test uh, on the skin, does it respond at all? Um, d- does it really um, have any firmness to it at all or is it just hanging? You know, And, and, and I think there's a big difference in what we can do Mm non-surgically and we had a gentleman and i don't know if we've ever talked about this we had a gentleman come in and he um, came because he had uh, it was painful for him to walk because the skin on his legs would literally brush against uh, each other when he walked i mean he had that much laxity because he had lost over a hundred pounds and did not want the surgery. And, you know, I, I looked at him, I did an assessment, and I thought, whoa, this, this is surgery. And I told him that, and he said, I won't do it. Can you help at all? And I said, well, we can do a, a treatment, but it'd be probably 15 treatments to make a difference. And um, he said, well, here's the thing. I'm, my family and I are leaving the state on such and such a date, how many can you do? And I said, well, I, I think we can get in seven. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he he was treated very aggressively for inner thigh, um, anterior thigh, lateral thigh, and posterior thigh. So the whole thing was uh, done very aggressively, and um, it was done seven times, roughly three weeks apart, which I would have liked it to be four weeks. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the bottom line was he was thrilled. Yes. And and I I think the thing is, you know, I mean, it's what are your expectations? Yeah. So his expectations are realistic. I mean, it wasn't going to get real tight and real Mm -hmm. firm, but it did um, solidify, if I can use that word. It, It did become more firm where it wasn't like flapping in the wind, so to speak. <laughs> I, know, I know that sounds horrible, but it's just, that's kind of how he described it. Yes. And, you know, it, where your skin is just moving like that, and it really did make a difference for him, and he was thrilled with it. So, yes. again, everybody's going to be different. Mm-hmm. I think we do have to look at each situation. Um, you know, what can you do for a face? What can you do for a neck? What can you do for the body? Mm-hmm. And how far you can take it. But uh, you really have to set the expectations correctly. Yes. It's, and I, it's not surgery. I agree. And that's the one most important thing that not only do I talk to patients about when I'm training offices on things, I always tell them, you know, we can get pretty close to a non-surgical facelift with all the technology we have out there. Our skin tightening for body when there's extreme laxity is never going to compete with surgical options. However, the downtime, the scars, the pain, sometimes people don't want that as part of it. So they're willing to trade a lesser improvement 
for having zero downtime. So the first area of non-invasive skin tightening we're going to jump into is the RF skin tightening that we do with Exilis and M-Tone. And we'll show a few before and afters of that going through. But these are top treatments for being able to treat large areas of the body. So there's arms, laxity with M-Tone. And as you can see, now she looks better in a tank top, which is what this person was trying to achieve. There is both volume and laxity without having the three-quarter scar. So again, she's now in a tank top and not trying to hide that arm. Thighs, oh, and this is the hardest one to treat, but huge difference in her thigh laxity and starting before it gets extreme is probably one of the most important things that you can do. And I, I think they have to also recognize this is, you know, this is not inexpensive to do. No. You, you know, you're, no. because it is a lot of area. Yes. You know, you just, it's it just the way it is. And, and you know. There's uh, the decollete in there too. Women yeah. don't think about that, especially if you have larger breasts. Yeah. You've got to start protecting that chest. I That's always think about that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's my job. You know, somebody has to. Somebody has to think yeah. about the decollete. It's like you can't be in and public And there's another like Exilus that. arm one. That's yeah. a huge difference yeah. without the scar. It's amazing. But like you were saying, right, it's, it's a large surface area. When we were looking at that thigh photo, thighs are not just thighs. There's the front of the thigh, the outer thigh, the inner thigh, the back of the thigh, and the butt. That's five areas. And then how many treatments, if we're doing RF skin tightening, Larry, do you typically need per area? Well, it uh, depends on what you're seeing. So the assessment is critical. But here's where most offices go wrong. They, they'll tell you this is going to be four treatments. Well, hell no. It's, <laughs> you know, what can I say? Four treatments isn't going to do squat. You know, you, you, have to, you have to be real about it. I mean, I don't care what device you've got. You know, 80% of the time, it's going to be eight treatments to start to see something. I mean, really mm -hmm. nice. You know, that's that's really where you want to be. And again, most of these treatments are um, technology-driven and technique-driven. So yes. who's doing the treatment? I mean, if you have a, uh, a technician like we do that is aggressive and goes mm -hmm. for it and works her ass off. And doesn't care you know, if you yeah, whine. Yeah, she, you know, you're going <laughs> to whine a little bit. Okay, that's fine. I'm good with that. And she just car carries on. And, you know, uh, does it with with a lot of uh, aggression to get that <laughs> outcome that you're looking for. And uh, I, I don't know how else to say it. She's good at it and works hard at it. And the results show it exactly. so that's it i mean but if you're not if you're not getting if you don't have the right technology and you don't have the right technician doing it or someone that's got that attitude that this thigh or this butt or this stomach is my responsibility mm -hmm. and i have to make it happen for that person so you know if they have that attitude all the difference yes big yeah. big game changer so so besides the RF technology for skin tightening, you know, one of the other things that goes along with that is the high fem technology where not a lot of people think about this, but we briefly brought it up, Larry, where muscle loss also leads to skin laxity. And so using the high fem technology or the M sculpt for building muscle in the stomach, as well as building muscle in the arms and the legs. So in combination, you rebuild the muscle that you're losing and you can get some skin tightening on top. So this is showing a stomach with an M sculpt where it's not as much showing the muscle, but the difference in laxity and volume loss that is occurring all at once with literally zero downtime in this arm. This is with building muscle and you're getting the side effect of the skin tightening as well as some fat loss. You can see how much building that muscle just picks that arm up. And again, this is without having to look like you're, you know, trying to be in a bodybuilding competition, but having muscle, more importantly than laxity, helps to prevent against osteoporosis and other diseases out there. So it's important for patients to realize that part of the aging process is going to be muscle loss. And I know at one point you had that statistic for us of how much muscle you begin losing per year at a certain age. I think starting at age 40, That's I think what you, I was... you lose about 1% a year. Yeah. So, you know, by the time you hit 60, you've lost 20%. And how much working out are you doing yes. during that time? And so, you know, if you've lost 20% at age 60 mm -hmm. and you're starting from scratch, 
Um, you know, that's a real uphill battle. Yes. You know, how do I get all that back? Of course, you're losing some volume because of that. You're losing your strength because of that. Yep. You're losing your definition and your shape because yes. of that. And so it's really multiple things all going on at the same time. So if you can get in there and you can find something, and we believe the M-Sculpt Neo is the answer to that. Yes. Because it is doing multiple things for you at the same time. Yes. So we, we love it for you know almost anywhere on the body where there is uh, muscle involved. Yes. And uh, it absolutely makes a nice difference for our patients. Yeah. And so then the next section that we're going to lead into is the RF microneedling. And we specifically use both the Scarlet and the Silver Mex. There's multiple other microneedling RF devices out there. But this can be an excellent option for patients too. The thing is about non-invasive skin tightening is some patients respond better to certain technologies and other patients respond better to other technologies. So it's not a one size fit all. That's why we have multiple, where again, this is a decollete laxity. This is Larry's favorite area. And if he does your consult and you haven't done anything with your decollete, he will point that out. <laughs> In multiple ways. And then look at this face and neck. Again, this is a non-surgical, no downtime, really minimal discomfort. I mean, Larry and I might whine a little bit on the table, but the average patient can tolerate these RF microneedling treatments without a, a lot of pain or anything like that. No drugs needed, no injections needed. It's literally just topical numbing. I think uh, you threw my name in there by accident. <laughs> I, I don't think I whine. I think I am like a rock. I mean, I do have videos that we can show on this <laughs> if you would like me to. <laughs> oh, yeah, they that, stab you in that, the back. They prove you yeah. otherwise. <laughs> Hey, I said that I whine too, so I'm not just picking on you, but if you want to act like you're stoic, I definitely have video proof that, that will show us otherwise. It was probably a more aggressive treatment. <laughs> so these are options, and this is full body. So again, this is something that most technicians can do. So again, physicians don't have to be stuck doing this. That's one of the best parts about these non-invasive. And with RF microneedling, face, neck, chest, arms, the back of hands that people forget about sometimes where it's really hard to treat with other technologies, very easy to get back of hands, elbows, knees, all these laxity areas that are even harder to get are excellent to be treated with RF microneedling. Yeah, and I, th I think um, it has come into its own over the last few years. Yes. And uh, there are a lot of systems out there. So no matter what office you go to, they, can, they probably offer RF microneedling. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two systems that we think are the best systems on the planet. Of yes. course, we wouldn't, have, <laughs> we wouldn't have bought them if we didn't think so. Right. But other offices, I'm sure, will say the same thing, uh, mm -hmm. no matter what they have. And uh, so we believe that that's part of it. And then, again, it always comes down to technique. Yes. Who's teaching you how to make that difference? And if the person teaching you how to make the difference is like the godfather of microneedling RF, that helps. You know, how to lift uh, eyebrows, how to tighten eyelids, how to do all these different things. And, of course, you can do the body as well. Mm -hmm. So, again, some of it is, you know, what technology do you have and then how good was the training and what you can do with it. So Which, how, how to get the most out of it, I guess. Is. By the way, when I was speaking at the Evelis dinner the other night, there was an office that had just trained with us on RF microneedling, and we had treated one of the ladies' stretch marks, and she said they look amazing. Fantastic. I know. It was, it's yeah. awesome to see that when you're done. So there's always different things you can do with that. But the RF microneedling then leads me into fractionated resurfacing. So there's fractional CO2 and there's fractional erbium. This is also an option for skin laxity, which necks, chest, hands, arms. Um, it can be aggressive so that a lot of times you can get there a little bit faster. However, one of the trade-offs for fractionated resurfacing is going to be risks of hyperpigmentation and a little bit more downtime with it versus the RF microneedling. So that's why... You know, you always have to have the conversation with your patient. How fast do you want to get there? You know, what, what Fitzpatrick skin type are they? Are they even a candidate for fractionated resurfacing? Or what other route do you have to go with them? 
And especially when you're talking about the body, because the body takes so much longer. Yes. You know, if you do fractional resurfacing on a face, um, you know, five days, you're pretty good. Yeah. Uh, you do fractional resurfacing on the thigh, uh, three to four weeks. Yes. So, I mean, it's just such a dramatic difference in how long it takes. However, uh, with our system, you can build in how much heat you want, how much contraction you're trying to get, how mm -hmm. deep you want to go, how many holes you want to put in. You can program it a lot of different ways. So, again, I think, it, it, again, one tool isn't for everyone. Yes. So if you have multiple ways to be able to do something and treat someone, I think that's, you know, I think that's the answer nowadays. It's more expensive, you know, to have to have you know, product A, B, C to be able to do it. But if you're using just one product for everything, uh, in all likelihood, you're not going to have the consistency uh, across the board that you'd like to see. Yeah, and that's where we always say that in the aesthetic world, one plus one equals three. That's right. right. So if you're doing two different technologies, you're always going to get a better result. Yeah. A couple other technologies that are commonly used. Um, one is ultrasound that's out there for skin tightening. Um, another one that we also use in our office is near infrared skin tightening. So we do use the skin tight by Cyton that can be used for different body parts. Um, here's a stomach before and after. Again, this patient did not want the tummy tuck scar or anything like that. She still wanted to wear a bikini. Look at the huge difference in the stomach. No downtime. Now with near infrared, you do have to be careful. Here's another excellent skin tightening photo. Again, these are patients that did not want the scar, did not want the downtime. So you can see a big difference in that. Um, with near infrared though, you do have to be careful sometimes with things like sun exposure and um, Fitzpatrick skin type and things like that. However, this also works great in small bony areas like decollete and hands where sometimes it's harder to treat with larger RF devices. How about threads? Yep, so that is next on the list. So I do a lot of PDO threads in our practice, and I use them as the writing on the icing on the cake. So when <laughs> he's advertising um, some tightening of his neck, do it again, Larry, do it again. Oh, yes, oh, yes, nice, nice clean jawline. <laughs> but when I train offices on PDO threads, I always tell them, this is, again, the writing on the icing on the cake. Use your energy-based devices to build the cake. The threads top it off. Whenever you are doing non-invasive body skin tightening, I highly recommend PDO threads in combination with whatever you're using. If you're using RF, RF microneedling, fractionated resurfacing, ultrasound, near infrared, you should top it off with a series of threads. And this is where you're gonna layer them in to stimulate collagen, and this will really build on that one plus one equals three, where you've given a patient an energy-based device, now you're putting in a PDO thread that will break down and stimulate collagen, and that should be the final top-off of the procedure. Uh, if I can comment on that also, um, we teach this, of course, because uh, we teach everything, but um, who's doing it is not always the same. Yeah. So, you know, you, you may want to just ask a few questions and then what threads are they using? Mm -hmm. What's their experience with them? So, again, you, you do your uh, due diligence just like you would for anything else. Yeah. Ask the questions and make sure you're comfortable with what's being said. And, and, you know, if you're going for a lift, how much lift are you going to get? Are you yes. going to be able to really bring it back and make a big difference? Or is it so-so? Um, so make sure you find out. And sometimes it may be just to, to fill in a little bit of the nasal labial fold or something like that. So just yeah. ask those questions. Make sure you're getting the answers that you need to, you need to have to make your decision. Yeah, and I just treated, um, I think a couple weeks ago, a gentleman who's in his early 70s for laxity of both lower face and neck. And he was sent to me by another clinician in the industry. His wife did not want him to have a facelift because he has a pacemaker and a couple other cardiac issues and has had a stroke in the past. So they were just really worried about anesthesia. They didn't want to do anything that was going to be anesthesia that could put him at risk for death. So, but he didn't, he wanted to do something. He wanted to look better because his wife looks amazing. So they came in, they did it. It was a huge difference in what we did with his face and neck when we combined the two together just with PDO threads. Now, I do get consults that come in a lot for PDO threads where sometimes they've had that lipoatrophy of the face. So that leads me to one of our final 
areas that we're going to address, which is volume loss leading to the laxity, especially in face. And Sculptor is one of the top things that I use. I like to use it for butt. And this is a perfect example of Sculptra after four vials with the lipoatrophy of the face treating that laxity. I had a lady just last week come in for a consultation that looked just like that, and she wanted threads. If I'm trying to run PDO threads through tissue that has no fat or subcutaneous tissue, number one, it's going to be like having a facelift without fat transfer in a patient like that, where they're going to look like a windblown skeleton. And number two, you could possibly see the thread. So I had to educate her look. Even though you're seeing the laxity, she was pulling on it right here, it was because she had so much lipoatrophy throughout her face. And when I explained it to her, she now has scheduled her initial sculpture treatment where we are going to replace that proper volume in her face because, again, side effect of rapid weight loss or weight loss when you're older is your face gets nailed with the fat loss too. And I always tell my patients, the first place fat is leaving is your face and the last place fat comes back to is your face. So it, you, you always look older when you lose weight, and that's where sculpture can be a huge um, advantage to patients who have lost it with replacing it naturally where you won't end up with this huge fat face where sometimes other fillers can't quite do that because sculpture can address it in a different way. And I still use hyaluronic acid fillers like Restylane and Juvederm and Versa products as well, but it's picking the right tool to treat the right area. And in the hollow of the cheeks and the preauricular area and jawline, Sculpture just does a better job, as well as in butts, right, Larry? It's very important to keep that butt tight. I know. You've been wanting your Sculpture treatment in your butt, haven't you? I, I don't want the laxity. I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I watched a television show, Sex in the City, and uh, it, I was just channel surfing, came across it, and it was, it was the show where um, the... Uh, the Samantha. Samantha. He sleeps around a lot, I think. Uh, <laughs> that's what I had heard. Yeah, no, and she does on the show. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So she's, uh, you know, she's at dinner with this guy, and the guy is cool. He's I mean, a billionaire. He's, yeah, he's a stud. He's rich. He's fun. He's all the good things. Well, the very next scene, they're in bed together, and um, so that's all going well, and he has to go to the bathroom. So he gets up out of bed and starts walking to the bathroom. And, of course, the camera zooms in on his butt cheeks. And they were <laughs> hanging. I mean, you know, it was like, and you could just see in her face. And, you know, she's thinking, you know, cool guy, rich, fun. And then over on the other side, you know, hanging butt cheeks. <laughs> you know, you could just see how this is going back and forth. And I thought, oh, God, that can't be me, you know. <laughs> And uh, so she jumps out, out of bed, grabs her stuff, and leaves. Before he gets so, back from the yeah, bathroom. Yeah, before he gets back. It's like I, she's not going to have anything to do with those butt cheeks. <laughs> so, you know, my, my goal is to make sure, you know, my butt's good. It's lifted. It's firm. It's mm -hmm. tight. And when I'm 95 and in a nursing home, I can wear a bathrobe backwards. <laughs> you know, and just kind of go down the hall. And, you know, I think it would be fun. It would be great fun. So it's important to keep you know, high, tight, you know, firm, yep. good, good butt. So it's the same re it's the same reason why when women sometimes come in asking to possibly reduce the volume in their butt, which doesn't happen as much anymore. I always tell the women, we're not going to make your butts any smaller. We're going to tighten them because you want them high and tight and firm. If you reduce volume, you can create saggy, flappy, flat, and that is not attractive in the rear end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's a big, and when you're doing an assessment, you know, again, do you have a device to actually lift and build some muscle and get a good athletic looking butt? And in addition, what else? Well, loose skin. So you need to do both if, yeah. if you can. Yep, which brings me to what do patients need to consider with their weight loss, Larry, right? Well, everything. You know? yeah. It's like, what's going to happen? What happens to the skin? So is there something I can do to prevent any problems or mm -hmm. issues down the road? What, wh how does this go? And uh, so I think, you know, if you are going to a med spa or a facility and you say, I am starting a weight loss program, uh, it's semi-aggressive. I, yeah, I want to drop, you know, 25, 30 pounds, whatever it might be. And I just want to make sure I can keep things, you know, firm, you know, during that process. Mm -hmm. And ag again, you know, between face, neck, 
chest, body, everything. There's a lot of ongoing parts there, but at least you can do something to stimulate collagen and, and uh, collagen growth and uh, tightening and firming along the way. Yeah. So, well, and I always tell patients, number one, if you can avoid morbid obesity, not only for your skin laxity, but obviously for cardiac issues, respiratory issues, liver issues, there's a lot of different things that are affected by morbid obesity. But number two, if you are going to begin your weight loss program and you are over 35, I highly recommend doing some skin tightening. Even though you don't see it yet when you're 35, you will have some laxity. And that's why even our women who've had lots of babies at a younger age, they snap back at first. But the second they cross over 40, all of a sudden they're seeing the laxity in their stomachs that they did not see when they were 28 when they had the baby. So it's important once you get to that area that you're doing skin tightening. And of course, like Larry said, also the muscle building. You need to keep that in mind as well. Whether you're doing your exercise on your own or you need some extra assistance in that, you have got to get the muscle as well as the skin tightening going when you're losing weight, especially when you are older. Remember, we only go around once. Why not? (laughs) (laughs) Unless somebody knows something I don't know. Uh, You know, so let's make the most of it. You know, be accountable to yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, we know we need to be accountable to others and, you know, but but let's be accountable to ourselves and to our Mm -hmm. appearance and to our body. And and, uh, I I think your mental wellness uh, many times goes hand in hand with your physical wellness. Absolutely. So, you know, do all of that, you know, and it's very, very helpful. This morning I, I, I had got gotten an email from uh, Martin Braun. He's a Vancouver Laser Center. Mm-hmm. And uh, it had some motivational things in there. And what, how the, um, um, you know, the Navy and how different people in different, you know, things, how they prepare for things and stuff like that. And it was like, I, I listened to this thing and I, I, was, I kept saying, okay, I'm going to turn off. And, and I kept listening. And it was <laughs> like, well, damn, this is good stuff. Um, so anyway, anything that helps you motivationally, anything that does that and keeps you going, but be accountable. Absolutely. And I think that's going to wrap us up for today because I usually ask you your last words of advice, but I think you gave that to us right there. Yep. So again, if you are thinking about weight loss and you are in your 30s or older, start considering skin tightening with it. And thank you guys for joining us and we will see you next time. Bye bye.